engineers generally start from the how and then navigate their way through the what and then the, and then the why. So for example, okay, let's migrate to the cloud. What are we going to do with the cloud and why is kind of the last uh, uh, question. And the transition is really to kind of reverse that and to have engineers actually first and foremost uh, ask themselves the question of why. And so I started to put mechanisms in place to really kind of, you know, get engineers and business uh, closer and closer together. And the point of conjunction between these two cultures is really the client. So when you start thinking client, then all of a sudden you kind of think, uh, okay, what problems does the client have? What are the opportunities? And, you know, and then you kind of work backwards from that. Mm. That focus almost changes the profession of the engineer from someone that in a way is at the receiving end of a set of uh, instructions or specification to someone that actually sits at the table and, and, uh, and determines uh, you know, what's the art of the possible. Culture does take a while to, to percolate down through an organization, particularly a large organization, and the world is moving pretty fast out there. How have you tried to kind of speed up that process and really kind of deliver that change a little bit faster? Is there anything that you've worked on to make that happen? You know, I write an email to all engineers about every two weeks. And one of the very first emails that I wrote uh, was uh, the difference between speed and velocity. And the difference between speed and velocity is essentially think about velocity being speed with a vector that is aligned. And speed itself might not be necessarily a good thing. Velocity definitely is. And so sustained speed is what I, what I mean by velocity. That means that uh, in some cases, it might actually take a, a bit longer to get started with the project because I actually want people to write it down and go through the working backwards process and so forth. But then if you look at the entirety of the time from idea to delivery, it's actually shorter. Because once you have a clear mental model of what you have to build and why and what are the functional and non-functional specifications and, uh, you know, and then you know that that's aligned all the way through with, the, with, the, with actually what the client needs, then at that point, uh, you're kind of starting to go with tailwinds that are actually kind of, uh, you know, end, end, end up speeding up uh, your process. So I think for me, really creating this uh, clarity was the biggest accelerant of the process. Okay. The other thing that is like, you know, probably hinting at this is uh, banks are not generally known for, uh, you know, hyperspeed, uh, although I've seen a lot of examples of hyperspeed uh, in, in, in Goldman and other places. But how do you do that in a regulated environment is a question that, uh, you know, of course I had to deal with, okay? And so, I mean, what I have in my mind is like, you know, the concept of the efficient frontier in, uh, in, in portfolio management, which is that you're kind of trying to find what, navigate this frontier between your gains and the risk that you're taking, okay? And so trying to be, uh, you know, very mindful and very thoughtful on how you manage your risk and how you manage your, uh, uh, your process around risk and how you're aware of your risks. And then you kind of, at that point, within that envelope, you try to, you know, remove the barrier so that we can achieve the maximum velocity, I think is kind of the art here. And given that my personal experience is that the more time you put on the left of the process, so you think it through, and then the building part actually goes much faster once you have a really good blueprint. I think, uh, you know, that's the way I've been kind of trying to get the engineers to think about instead of thinking of regulation or instead of thinking of regulations in a way as a barrier, you think of that as something that will allow you, if navigated correctly, to build things right, and i.e. you will actually go faster and be more efficient. Do you think this is, I think for certain people listening to this, it could sound ambitious and laudable, but also perhaps a little bit esoteric, like you know, changing culture, using control planning to, to enable things. Down at the coal face, where you have, you know, what, 15,000 developers and engineers working, do you think that has percolated down to meaningful change in how your developers work yet? Do you think they'd recognize this characterization of, of, of you know, the modus operandi really changing? Well, I mean, I like to believe so, although it's a journey. So the, uh, it's like, uh, you know, we're in the middle of that journey. So there are parts uh, of the organization that are definitely like more, uh, a bit more sensitive to implement this and others uh, than others. But then if I look at the facts, the way we actually look at execution overall and the monitoring with regards to speed of delivery, number of defects, number of incidents, number of failed deployments, amount of technical debt that we've been reducing. So we have a tremendous apparatus of 
KPIs and metrics. In fact, one of the things that we do is strive to operate our business in full transparency and almost in real time. So we have this weekly engineering leadership meetings and, and, and operational meetings where we track a very robust number of delivery KPIs. Yeah. Um, and uh, we hold people accountable for those. We track our flagship projects uh, in a very granular way and against, uh, you know, weekly against their, uh, their, their, their execution and risk using, you know, two by two matrices of risk uh, uh, versus uh, headwinds and tailwinds and uh, what is the kind of status of each of the projects. And if you look at all those metrics, you can kind of see like the health of the organization that is, uh, that is uh, progressing. You see projects that are, first of all, tracked, mm. And then they're tracked, uh, uh, you know, they become more and more uh, on time and on budget. And then you look at technical debt that gets reduced uh, further and further. You see cloud migration that is progressing. You see data that is organized and modeled in a way that is consistent across the firm and so on and so forth. So I tell you that we went really, really quickly from theory to practice. And in fact, this other tenet that we have, uh, which is lead with data, it's something that uh, has been the way we kind of in a way, create this ground truth that will allow us to understand if the culture is actually changing. Let's just pick up on the technology debt side of things a little bit. And perhaps I'm not sure if you're able to share a couple of, of examples of you know, maybe priorities for you over the next 12 to 24 months in terms of whether that's on the infrastructure side yeah. or the application side. Are there any key focuses for you mm -hmm. at the moment to kind of push projects yeah. through? So one of the very first thing that I said was we celebrate retirement of technical debt the same way as we celebrate the release of a new project. And that changes everything because then people actually want to do that. <laughs> because if you get no rewards and no incentives to actually do the work that nobody else, will, everybody wants to do the shiny thing, okay? But guess what? There is a, a lot of engineers, including myself, by the way, that I really, we really enjoy when things go from a state that, you know, doesn't really comply to, you know, your own standards even, to a place where you can say, okay, this is modern, this is maintainable, this is scalable. And it might not be a new feature, but it's something that actually, you know, we're very proud of, the same way as if we were launching a new one. And so back to that, the first step of, of reducing technical debt, first of all, is again, to change the culture around technical debt, so you celebrate it. The second one is to pick your battles. Prioritization in retirement of technical debt is the thing. You need to triage all the time because the biggest mistake that people do when they come in into you know, an environment that has technical debt is to try to fix everything. There are, you know, you need to put them in a risk matrix that says, okay, yes, it's legacy, but for example, is it operationally sound? And then you start from, okay, maybe it's legacy and not operationally sound. And then you go from, uh, you know, and you kind of navigate that. And so prioritize, prioritize, prioritize. That's the second point. The third point is one of the most difficult part to protect the budget around retirement of technical debt. Because obviously, one of the instincts uh, of the business is obviously to kind of, you know, forget about technical debt and let's actually push stuff that will drive more revenue, okay? And I have to say that uh, that was also a little bit of a cultural shift where uh, you know, even recently, like, you know, we, we hear like our top leaders actually even talking about the importance of retiring technical debt because everybody realizes that it's so important to, 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 to get to, you know, a modern, scalable and maintainable infrastructure, a robust infrastructure. And one of the things that, you know, we historically have done is to build a lot of software in-house, which we continue to do. But, you know, one of the tenets that I kind of pushed for at the beginning was that you need, before you build, uh, make sure that there isn't someone out there that would actually do it for you. Mm. So there has been a shift towards using, you know, vendor products or open source products for everything that is not uh, creating unique intellectual property or unique uh, differentiation for us. And so when I talk about uh, we built uh, 10 platforms, I have to say that pretty much in every single case, we made use of a mix of managed services, uh, uh, open source software, et cetera. But those products, you cannot just take them uh, as is and put them to work in, a, you know, in, a, in an environment like ours or any uh, environment of our complexity in a way. And so we had to build uh, a lot of software around them to implement our controls, to implement our observability, to make them work uh, you know, within our environment. And so it's kind of 
you know, building the glue and building the right set of controls and building the right set of technology around it. Building foundational technology as we do it when it's really needed for the business, but generally, I mean, uh, uh, obviously, you're much better off in leveraging, kind of standing on the shoulder of giants. Yeah. Picking up on that, a slight tangent, but picking up on that, you know, the technology and, and what is possible on the technological front is evolving super fast. And perhaps it's not your job as a, a CIO or an engineer of your stature now to be tracking that. but. How do you stay on top of the art of the possible there with technology and how do you make sure that your teams are really perhaps keeping an open mind to some of the emerging technology coming yeah, through? It's a great question. So other than reading the stack, the answer is you need to be talking to people. If you're just completely internally focused, then it can become an echo chamber. And so I personally like, uh, and I tell also my team, and uh, we also invite people, like recently we had uh, a partner meeting where I invited multiple, like, you know, voices from the outside. Really, the interaction with others is how you get on top of things. Mm -hmm. I cherish my, my network and other people, you know, I plug into other people's network and, uh, and I try to use every opportunity that I have in order to talk to my peers, to talk to, you know, the people uh, within the vendors at every level, to talk to other developers, to participate to developer meetups. Uh, that's where you feel like, you know, the vibe of, of, of things and people when you talk to developers they kind of know what the things are you know which one are good and which one are not and i love to connect not just at the cio or ceo level but also like talk to actual developers it's always been one thing for me being in touch with the developer community is probably like uh, you know the recipe that has been working for me throughout my career for sure